The story at Roosevelt Park with a Corktown neighborhood is connected to the story of the construction of the Michigan Central train station. The train station opened on December 26, 1913, and the structures on the future park were meant to be gone by then, but they weren't because the residents who were living there resisted the displacement. About 100 structures remained in front of the train station in the 19-teens. Some of them were abandoned, some of them were occupied. So there was a huge struggle in the newspapers, in the courts, in the public arena, and it culminated in some pretty horrific removal tactics. This was in 1918. There were three structures that still stood on 15th Street, very close to the train station. About 20,000 people marched alongside a British army tank named Britannia as it rolled down Michigan Avenue, turned on 15th Street, and tore through the houses. So that was how the park was finally demolished. What we're researching at Roosevelt Park is the history of this displaced community. What happened during the displacement process? Was there, is there any archeological evidence of the resistance? We also want to know more about the neighborhood and the families who lived there before the condemnation suit, and before the displacement began. And these are families who were working class. They came from a variety of different occupations, a variety of different ethnicities, and their stories are not told in the history of Detroit. My name is Krista Rizuski, and I'm an archeologist at Wayne State University. All right, let's get to work. The things that people threw away 100 years ago are in many ways just as mysterious as the things that people threw away in ancient Egypt three, four, five thousand years ago. Because often what people say they do and what they actually do are two very, very different things. So the students who are excavating at Roosevelt Park are focusing on the private areas of household activities, the backyards of the houses, the privies and the outhouses and the outbuildings. Lauren is scraping back uh, the soil layer here in an even and uniform fashion using a trowel. We use trowels or flat shovels to kind of maintain spatial control and the horizontal level over the excavation unit. Every soil layer that's distinguished from layers above or below it by different textures or different soil colors has a number, we call it a context number. So what they have on the bag is a label that tells us the archeological context, the find spots. Well, the soil gets picked up, put in this bucket, and then we'll take it over to our screening station and we have an artifact sieve. So they're looking for any, any artifacts, any architectural materials, nails, small brick fragments, uh, personal effects. The fragments that we have to work through are essentially puzzle pieces. And to fit together those puzzle pieces, we need to work with the objects themselves, the historical documents, and also the find spot, the soil context of the objects, how they relate to the soil, how they relate to the buildings that they were next to. Look at that. That's about it. We have the seam. Yeah, you do. This is a medicine bottle. This would have had like some sort of pill or elixir in it. Clear off that dirt. And we did some research, background research on the bottle, and we found that this particular bottle dates to 1910. This brownatone product was advertised as a hair dye for women. The advertisement is speaking directly to working women, and it's encouraging them to look suitable for the workplace by getting rid of their gray hair. Gray hair was not acceptable in the early 20th century workplace, especially for women. So that was really exciting for us because it signaled that there was a female in the household that we were excavating who was working, perhaps. So that's something we'll follow up and do more research on. Now at Roosevelt Park, we started asking questions at the neighborhood level but we found so many artifacts, about 10,000 artifacts so far, that we're starting to learn more about the families who lived there. We found a doll head with decoration on it and a doll leg from lot four. We also found marbles from that same excavation unit and toys right next door to it in the lot three excavation unit. That tells us that there were children living on this property in the 1880s and 1890s 
And now we can go back to the census records, actually see the names of those children, how long they lived for, were they suffering from any medical conditions. We can trace them through other school records. Looking at Detroit today through the lens of archaeology, we're able to realize that Detroit is not a blank slate that's to be built upon with brand new things that don't connect with Detroit's past. Because so many people in Detroit have tangible connections to where their family used to live, but they don't want the memory of these places destroyed. So archaeology not only has a role in preserving the cultural resources and public history of the city, but it has a role in the future making of Detroit. I study a group of scorpions that belong to the genus Centroides, um, commonly known as the bark scorpions, and they make venom that is uh, intensely painful. Some people describe it as uh, the feeling or sensation of being burned with a cigarette or being branded, and that can be followed by a sensation you feel like somebody's hit you with a hammer. Hopefully the weather will hold, weather could will rain, hold we'll might be beautiful, we might got, not rain. We, yeah. got, we got over 100, 100 last, last night. night, which was not bad. Yeah, it's always a, it's a gamble, but.